Brow bossing reduction and orbital rim reduction is what we're gonna talk about today and some of the most common risks that go with it. Now, this is almost always done with a hairline advancement and a brow lift. And so some of the risks of the surgery are associated really more with the hairline advancement. So see those previous videos to discuss those risks. But with a brow bossing reduction, um, there's two options. One is what we call a type one brow bossing reduction, which is where I just burr down this part. This is actually really pretty uncommon. I would say probably less than 5% of people have a brow bone that is thick enough that I can actually burr it down and create the change that the patient wants to see. Now I do get a CT scan of every patient before surgery. So we know in advance whether we're planning to do a type one or a type three brow bossing reduction. For the patients who have a type one, the surgery is a little bit faster. They don't have to have any plates or screws, um, but honestly, it doesn't really make that much difference for the patient um, as far as healing and recovering. It, it's a little bit more work for me to do the type three than a type one, um, but I have not found that patients have necessarily any more pain, any more swelling um, with a type one versus a type three, because the part of the procedure that the patients really have to deal with is the big incision that it takes to get there. So a type three brow bossing reduction is where I actually remove the anterior table of the frontal sinus, reshape it, reshape this part of the forehead, put the table, the, the bone back on, but in a more recessed position. So imagine this, imagine this whole area here. This is your front, it's called your frontal sinus. Imagine it's like a cave. What I am doing is taking the door off of the cave kind of reshaping everything, rede redesigning it, then putting the door back on, but further into the cave. And so what this does is create a nicer, smoother contour here in the brow bone area. At the same time, I almost always do an orbital rim reduction. So that is reducing the bone here and here in the area that's either below or under the eyebrows. Now, every patient's different and that's why there's not like a standard one to one procedure some patients this is really the thick part some patients this is the thick part some people have both i basically do whatever i need to do to create a nice smooth contour over the eyes that flows softly and gently into the nose orbital rims can almost always just be reduced with a bird this bone is very thick i do measure it i do look at it on the ct scan but i have never seen a case where i wasn't able to burr as much as i needed to do in order to get the result that I want. The other thing that I do is I burr it not only in the horizontal plane, but I actually burr out the orbital rim a little bit. Um, there have been several good studies that show that although men's brow bossing and this kind of ledge is more projected and bigger, women actually have bigger orbits. So the orbital volume, the, the eye socket is actually bigger in women. So I'm trying to reduce the projection of the brow bone, but also make the eye a little bit bigger. And what that does is allows more light to come in the eyes, makes the eyes look softer, brighter, and we take that generally as a more feminine cue. So the risks with this procedure, as you can imagine, are great. However, there are few risks with this procedure that I have actually seen or actually heard of. Anytime we're drill, using drills, saws in this area, there's obviously a risk that we could do damage to the structure below, which is the brain. I have never come close to having this happen. Um, I've never heard of this happening. That doesn't mean the risk is zero, but it's really, really low in skilled hands. So this is definitely a surgery you wanna to go to someone who has done many, many, many of them. Um, again, I get a CT scan because I like to do measurements ahead of time. So I measure exactly where I'm going to make my cuts, how big the sinus is. Some people have asymmetric sinuses where one is bigger than the other. I plan and map all of that. I measure all of that beforehand. So I, once I get to the operating room, I know exactly where I'm going to make my cuts. There's no surprises. It's all planned and done already. Um, again, that doesn't make the risk zero, but it really does minimize the risk of having some kind of a problem with um, like an intracranial complication because I know exactly how thick that bone is. I know exactly where the cuts are gonna be. Um, so that risk is low, 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 low. 
Uh, there's always a risk anytime we're putting plates on um, that that bone doesn't heal or doesn't heal as well as we want it to. Again, I have never seen that happen. Um, I have heard of a case where the bone absorbs or absorbs more than we want it to. There are several things that I do to prevent that from happening. Um, one, I just put two very small, minimally palpable plates onto the bone. I don't put a mesh. The bone lives by the blood flow from the periosteum. The bone itself does not have blood supply, so it has to get blood supply from the skin over it. So I try to not put anything over the bone that will impair the ability of the skin to heal onto the bone and provide the blood supply. So I don't put any big mesh. Um, I put a little bit of bone paste on the corners, but not in the middle, so that ideally that heals as quickly as possible and minimizes any risk of bony absorption because it becomes well revascularized quickly. Um, there's always a risk of some little lumps or bumps. What I do is I actually take the dust, the bone dust from the burring down the bone and from burring down this area, mix it with a little bit of blood and create like a natural bone paste. I put that all around the edges of the bone flap to help it, like it's like bone cement, it just helps it to seal and heal a little better. It also helps to fill in any irregularities, any contour irregularities, makes the forehead nice and shiny smooth. Um, other risks with this um, are really the more the risks associated with the brow lift, but weakness on the side, problems with this, this uh, scar healing, um, which were discussed in some of the previous videos. As far as for the brow bone reduction itself, um, it's actually relatively low risk in skilled hands. Um, so it is probably the most powerful procedure in facial feminization. Reducing the brow bone and opening up the eyes creates a beautiful change in the upper third of the face. Um, and so it's something that most patients do uh, opt to do when undergoing facial feminization surgery.